Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Well, hey, everybody. Hey, so good to see you. Glad you're here today. If you're just joining us, uh, we're kind of on the tail end of a sermon series on relationships where we've been talking about how to uh, fight for rather than with, how to fight for your family, your spouse, your parents, uh, your kids, your friends. And uh, within this series, we're doing two parts on marriage. Last week, uh, we talked all about the meaning of marriage. Uh, if you didn't hear that, you can listen to that online. Uh, just it, Marriage wasn't a man-made construct. God created it. Why did he create it? Why does marriage exist? Why is it worth for, fighting for? What's the purpose of marriage? We look specifically at this statement from Jesus. Look at it with me in Mark 10, where Jesus said, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, man will leave his father and mother and be united, united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one, no longer two but one flesh, therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate, no longer two but one. That word united there uh, is an intense word, it's so strong. Uh, It means that the man is to cling to his wife, that it's to be joined to his wife, that he is to be bonding and holding fast to his wife. It's an intense relationship. So no no longer, uh, this is my family and that's your family. This is my job, that's your job. This is my life, that's your life. This is my money, that's your money. Here are my debts, there are your debts. This is my account, that's your account. No longer, these are my problems, those are your problems. It's all scrambled together. They're no longer two, but they are one. That this is our job, our money, our account, our family, our life, our problems. We are one. And Psalm 133, 1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. How good and pleasant it is when a married couple live together in unity. And that's possible. A good marriage is possible. Do you still believe that? You probably believed that at one time. Do you still believe that now? And sometimes we, we, we don't believe that because conflict can make a marriage miserable. But all couples fight. All couples argue. So you're, you're not going to... There is no one on planet Earth you're going to agree with about everything 100% of the time. Stop looking, they're not there. I don't even agree with myself 100% of the time. (laughs) So that's a lot of pressure to put on Lauren that we're going to agree 100% of the time on everything. It's not going to happen. All couples are going to disagree. They're going to fight. They're going to argue. But there is a difference. There is a difference. There is a difference. Between fighting for personal victory, fighting to win, fighting to be right, and fighting for unity, fighting for resolution. And healthy couples fight for resolution, for unity. Unhealthy couples fight for victory. They fight to be right. So as we approach this message, uh, there are a few different people uh, among us. Uh, Some of you have never heard what I'm going to teach today before. You've never heard it before. And you need to take good notes Quite honestly, you need to listen again on the podcast this week, and you need to read the blog recap at rockbrook.org, and you need to internalize this message. Some of you have heard this message before, and it's very timely uh, that you hear it again. God's working in your life. Some of you have heard this before, and you've put it into action. Like, today's just going to be a total rerun for you, and you're like, we got this, man. This worked, and you're going to praise God today, and you're going to give God a thanksgiving offering of worship to him that God thank you for healing my marriage thank you for bringing unity to my marriage and you're going to worship him with all you have there's a fascinating study you can read about um, from a guy named Dr. John Gottman Uh, he's kind of a marriage specialist and he studied couples who fight he studied couples who fight for 16 years 
And he watched them as they disagreed, as they argued, as they fought, um, to see how they fought. And now he says he can watch a couple disagree for less than five minutes and discern within 91% accuracy whether or not that couple's going to make it. Whether or not, like, they'll get divorced one day. He can deter, he just, he says, because every couple disagrees at times. Every couple argues. Every couple fights. And it's not about whether or not you fight, it's about how you fight. And as couples, we're going to learn to seek God, and we're going to learn to fight well. And what I'm teaching you today uh, has, it's helped my marriage so much. A little bit about me, I've been married for almost 10 years, um, got a kid, got another one on the way, and uh, I love road trips. I love road trips with my wife. I love car time in, with my wife. I love conversations in the car. If we're going to go on a road trip, I spend days planning the playlist that we're going to listen to. I love listening to music with my wife. I love listening to podcasts with my wife. But there have also been some tense times in the car with my wife. Oh, come on. I'm the only guy in here that's had a tense time in the car with his wife. Get real. Wow. Because I don't, I'm not always in the right lane. And I don't always turn when I'm supposed to turn. And I don't always stop when I need to stop. And I don't always go when I need to go. And I guess when I was single, I must have, must have just spent hours on end at a green light without going. I don't, I don't know. I just... By the way, Lauren, Lauren, my wife, has approved all the jokes today, so we're free to laugh, free to have a good time. I've learned that if you do that beforehand, you don't go home on Sunday afternoon in trouble, so I've tried to... But I get to thinking about other things and while I'm driving, and I take a lot of wrong turns, and the same thing happens in our marriages. And if you've ever gotten lost on your way to a destination... Like you wanted to be in a certain place, but you wound up in another. And every, everybody's got that story of how they, they were going someplace for vacation or they were going someplace for camping or something. They took some wrong turns, they got lost, they wound up in another place. And the story never goes, we wanted to go here, but we ended up here. And it was so much more beautiful and pleasant. We just decided to stay there. No, it's like we wanted to go there. We ended up here, and there were like bed bugs and cockroaches, and we almost got shot. And it's like, <laughs> it's just this crazy, unpleasant story. And the same thing happens in marriage. As we get married, and we want to end up in this pleasant place over here, but we take some wrong turns along the way. And maybe that's you today. Of you've, you're, you're not in the pleasant place you wanted to be. You're in some place else, and there were some wrong turns that took you there. And the same way it happens in marriage, it's the same way it happens when you're driving somewhere, you take some wrong turns. Let me identify some common wrong turns we take in marriage. The first wrong turn we take is we start fighting, but we start fighting the wrong enemy. Somehow, we have believed the lie that the person we are married to is the enemy, or they're the obstacle. And we think you have become the obstacle to me having the life I want. And our culture paints men and women, husbands and wives, as adversaries. And it's a lie. Your husband, your wife, is not your adversary. And it's a lie that the devil desperately wants you to believe. And when you believe that, you have believed the enemy. Why does the enemy want you to believe that your spouse is the enemy. Because when you view your spouse as the enemy, you don't remember who the real enemy is. Ephesians 6.12, I remind you of this all the time. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces. You're in a spiritual war, a battle. Your enemy is spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And we look at the person we're married to, we think they're the enemy, they're not the enemy, they're the ally. Are you being your spouse's greatest ally in their fight against a very real enemy? The next turn, wrong turn we make is that we are driven by wrong motives. We're driven by the wrong things in marriage. This is why last week's 
message on marriage is so important, so foundational. We've got to remember why marriage matters, why God created it. James tells us what causes the fights in our lives, what causes fights and quarrels among you. Don't they come from your desire, the desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill, you covet. You cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask God, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And the word spend there is actually the word waste. That you're asking God for what you want, but only to waste it on your own pleasures and your own desires. How many times does, the, does you and your appear in that passage? That we make a wrong turn when we rob, operate out of the motives of self, self-interest, self-promotion, self-preservation, self-defense. But when two people focus on God, it brings tremendous unity to their marriage. The third wrong turn we take is we're using wrong tactics. We're demanding our right to be right. And the greatest relationships take place between two servants, two people that are not demanding their right to be right, but two people who are trying to outdo one another in yielding their rights to the other. Proverbs 18, 19, an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. And the difference, the difference between healthy couples and unhealthy couples is that healthy couples fight for resolution, healthy couples fight to be right, and they fight to win. And we've got to make a decision to change course, to quit making these wrong turns and to get back on track. And by the way, that's the hope today. You can get back on track. Uh, the, the other day, I was driving around Kansas City, uh, went and had breakfast with a pastor on the plaza, took a friend to the airport, met my sister at Union Station, visited a friend on the Kansas side. And I wasn't going any place I'd never been before, but I was coming at those places from directions I'd never gone at them before. So I had the GPS going. And it's just amazing to me how many wrong turns I take even when I'm following GPS and I've got <laughs> in the wrong lane at the wrong time and everything else. And you'd think with all the wrong turns I was taking that at some point the GPS would just say, what are you doing? <laughs> like, just check back in in a few minutes when you get to a place I recognize, like you're killing me here. But no, every time I took a wrong turn, what is the GPS doing? Recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. I could have driven all the way to St. Louis. It would have been recalculating all the way. And isn't that a picture of the Holy Spirit in our life? It's not the path I had for you. It's not the way I had designed. It's not what I wanted for you. And I'm sorry you took that wrong turn. And I'm sorry you wound up in that uncomfortable place. And I'm sorry you went through that dark road. And I'm sorry it was uncomfortable. I'm sorry you wasted your time. But come on, there's a way. I make a way where there, there seems to be done. And there's a new path, and I'm recalculating a new path, and the Holy Spirit can always make a way. No matter how many wrong turns, the Holy Spirit says to you today, come on, I've helped people who've made more wrong turns than you have. I can get you there. Come on, dial back in. Follow, follow the Word again. Follow God's voice in your life again. And some of us, we've taken some wrong turns in marriage and the Bible says, though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. And the Holy Spirit can make a way for you. So what are the right turns I can make in marriage? The correct turns to get the communication in my marriage back on track? And the answer is in God's word. In, in this amazing verse in James chapter 1, look at it with me. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. And we're going to take note of this this weekend. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. The righteous life that God desires. The heaven on earth experience God wants for your marriage. You've got to do it God's way to get that. So let's break it down. How does one verse by God through his Holy Spirit 
through James, how it can bring so much healing and teach us how to fight. James says you've got to be quick to listen. So what are we going to do? Number one, we're going to stop and listen carefully. Most of us react rather than respond. We get into a disagreement and we spout out a reaction and it's often wrong and we should stop and listen carefully. But what are we quick to do? We're quick to speak, aren't we? We're looking for any opening to get in whatever we prepared on the drive home. We're quick to speak. We want to get a blow in. We, instead, we want to be quick to listen. Do not let the power of simplicity pass you by. When we start to fight, what we, what we want to do is speak, and what we really need to do is make sure we're really hearing what the other person is saying. Here's what Scripture says happens if we don't. This is in Proverbs. A fool, everybody say a fool. A fool fool finds no pleasure in understanding. We all know someone like this. They don't care to understand. They don't want to understand. They find no pleasure in understanding. But they just delight in airing their own opinions. And the key is understanding. Rather than immediately reacting when we hear something we disagree with from our wife, from our boss, from a coworker, we really what we really need to do is make sure we're hearing what's being said. Because people don't hear what you say. They hear what they think you are saying. And you don't hear what people say. You hear what you think they are saying. And most arguments flow out of misunderstanding and miscommunication. Most arguments are about things people didn't really say or didn't really mean. That's not what they really think. That's not what they really believe. And people end up talking past each other. And one of the best ways to solve that problem is to repeat back to your spouse Repeat back to the coworker, to the boss, to the person. Repeat back what they're saying. Not in a condescending way, not in a defensive way, not in a way that puts them down like, let me get this straight. So you're telling me. <laughs> what you're saying is. But to say, so here's, here's what you just said, or here's what I hear you saying. And to say what they just said. I don't know how many times I've done this in my marriage or in a meeting or at work. And I'll say, so here's what you're saying. And they'll say, well, yeah, that's what I said, but that's not what I mean. Or, no, that's not what I'm saying. And it gives an opportunity for several things to happen. It gives an opportunity to force yourself to listen. It gives an opportunity for your spouse to be affirmed that you hear what they're saying. For, yeah, I said I would do something and I didn't do it. That would frustrate me too. Or yeah, I, I see this problem, I see this going on, and it's a problem. And it just, it, you're, you're becoming an ally to your spouse in that moment. Say, I understand why you would feel that way. It, it keeps the issue on the issue rather than the other person. So we've got to stop and listen carefully and make sure that we understand The second thing this scripture teaches us is to guard our words faithfully. To guard them faithfully. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Because our words can wound so deeply. The more you love someone, the more they love you, the more weight their words carry. I I mean, you you could say a lot of things to me. And it it would just kind of bounce right off. It, It wouldn't mean a whole lot. If my wife were to say it, if my parent, if my sibling, someone I, I really love were to say it, it carries more weight, doesn't it? And our words carry so much weight. Proverbs 21, 23 says, Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble.
And unfortunately, I'm the one in the room that has to talk after reading that verse. But hello, this is a new life verse for somebody in here. I wish this were my life verse in junior high and high school. Some of my biggest regrets in life have to do with things I've said. It's not, I didn't mean it. It's not what I really think. That's not what I really believe. It's not what I wanted to say to you. And a couple of great questions to ask yourself here are, should it be said? And when you're in a conflict, ask, should it be said? And ask, should it be said now? Because in the middle of a conflict, that's not the time to bring up other issues or to try and fix everything that's wrong in a marriage. Should it be said, and should it be said now? And if the answer is no, don't say it, because you can't take it back. You can't take back your words. So let me just give you some things that you need to leave out of conflict. Listen, if you're dating, if you're engaged, you're hearing this at a great time, before you start your marriage, you've just got to decide some things that you're going to leave off the table. If you're married, it's never too late to take them off the table and to say to your spouse, all right, new ground rules. Here's the things that we're never going to do. Write these down. We're never going to call names. It's just too wounding. It's not productive. The next one, never say never or always. This is one of the quickest ways to just be offensive, and it's rarely true. And I tell you, your argument's just shot. Because if you say you're never on time, they're gonna, you're always late. They're going to bring up the one time in 1978 they were on time to something, and it just doesn't work. So never raise your voice. You're escalating the argument. An argument, Dr. John Gottman says, an argument never rises above where it gets to in the first three minutes. So if you're in the first three minutes of a discussion with someone and it's already risen to a, to a bad place, just stop. Done. Come back another time. It's going nowhere good. The next one, never get physical. So we're using the, the word fight today interchangeably with argument or disagreement. But when one of you gets physical, it's over. You need to stop. You need to move on. If you're physically fighting, you need to get out. You need to get help. No room for that. Next one, never get historical. So don't be dragging out stuff from the past. My dad calls this gunny sacking. That you're, just, you're just spending weeks and months putting stuff in your gunny sack all little problems, things, and the next time the conflict comes out is, here's three months of every time you did this, and every time this happened, and now just keep the issue on the issue, stay focused. Next one, never, ever, ever threaten divorce. Don't do it. That is a low blow. It's uncalled for. When you got married, you threw away the key to the escape hatch. And divorce is not an option. And there is no good that comes from bringing it up, from threatening it. And lastly, my dad used to invoke this one, and I'll do it too when you're in, in an argument. Never quote the Bible or your pastor to prove your point. <laughs> Leave me out of it, please. I'm at home working on my own problems. Just <laughs> You got in, in it. You can get out of it. Never quote the Bible. Too many marriages, like the only time they bring the Bible into their relationship is in conflict. Don't do it. That, just, that's not the time to bring the Bible into your relationship. I know a pastor who is in an argument with his wife, and he said to his wife, uh, it says in Proverbs that it's better to live in the corner of an attic than with a contentious woman. And his wife said, well, and get on up there. What are you waiting for? So It always backfires. Don't do it. Don't do it. But let me ask you this. If you were to take these things out of your arguments, just you, because you can't control your spouse, but if you were to just take these things off the table, would your arguments be a lot more productive? But you've got to guard your words, and you've got to stop and listen carefully, and you've got to guard your words faithfully. And then finally, if you're taking notes, write this down. We're going to learn to handle our anger righteously. And this is so important because you will get angry. 
And we want to handle it by being led by the Spirit of God. Be slow to anger. I love Ephesians 4. In your anger, do not sin. So getting angry is not a sin. It's what you do with the anger. In fact, there's some things God is calling us to be righteously angry about that we've just accepted. We're we're not worked up about it anymore. We're not angry about it anymore. Quite honestly, there's things we need to be angry about again. We need to get angry about pornography and what it's doing to our minds and our marriages and our relationship with God. We need to get angry about racism. We need to get angry about a lot of other things that are just becoming the, the norm. And God says, no, that you need, don't accept that. Come on, get, get righteously angry about that. But what do you do with your anger? In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, meaning don't let too much time pass. Address it. Forgive it. Let it go. If you don't, you're going to let it fester. And if you let the sun go down on your anger, what happens? You wake up angry. And you give the devil a foothold, and he's drived a wedge into your relationship with God, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with others. And you end up waking up every day angry. Do you know anybody that wakes up every day angry? Doesn't look like a lot of fun, does it? doesn't look like it's bringing about the righteous life that God desires because that person has given the devil a foothold. And maybe your marriage has taken those turns, but you've got to make a decision that in times of conflict that you'll say, write this down, I I will fight for unity, not personal victory. And I want to tell you that if you seek God and you follow His Spirit leading you in these three things, I believe that the presence of God can bring about healing in any relationship. And some of you right now, you think there's no way this marriage could work. And when you're fighting, you need to stop and say, we're not going to fight against each other. We're going to fight for one another. And you need to get from being across the table and get on the same side of the table and say, I know I wounded you in this. I know I said I would do that and I didn't do it. I know I've offended you. I, 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 I I know I've sinned against you and sinned against God. And I repent. I'm... But I don't want us to fight. I want us to fight against our enemy. And I want to be your ally. Because our spiritual enemy is trying to destroy us. And we're going to fight for our marriage with everything in us. And we're going to disagree. But we're going to be quick to listen. And we're going to guard our words. And we're going to handle our anger righteously. And what marriages need is to be united. United in thought, mind, and purpose. What I see is that marriages need something bigger than their problems and their disagreements to live for. And what can happen in a a marriage is we spend so much time trying to work on our problems rather than have something bigger than our problems to live for to where those problems just become mere distractions. Too many lives and too many marriages, are are all they've done is live life and solve their problems. They lived for their problems. And God says, no, let's get a bigger vision. Let's get something bigger than these problems to live for and let those problems just become distractions. And and we've been talking about uh, this Rockbrook Conference for several weeks now, but it's coming up quick now. It's in two weeks. And it's it's a church conference. We're going to talk about the DNA of this church, the heartbeat of this church. But it's also about how God meets your deepest needs. What are your deepest needs? Well, you need a power to live on. You need people to live with. You need principles to live by. You need a profession to live out. And you need a purpose to live for. And so often we become so distracted in life, we get to just reacting by all the urgent things. We forget to, work, to focus on the important. And so as your pastor, I'm just encouraging you to take advantage of this conference. Take a Friday night, Saturday, half day on Saturday. Just retreat a little bit and focus on the important. This, by the way, those things up there, the power to live on, people to live, these are the, the session titles. So this is what we're going, these are the sessions for the conference. And we're going to have a lot of fun too. Uh, we'll have lunch together and the worship team's got awesome stuff planned, debuting some new songs and it's going to be powerful. Uh, we've got some other fun things planned for that. Uh, you will enjoy it. It's going to be a fun time. But I want you to see your life and your marriage be blessed 
to bring about the righteous life God desires. I don't want you to see you live and die for your problems. To just live life solving worldly problems. But to get God's vision for your life. I put at the bottom of your notes a very simple prayer. My challenge to you today is just to keep that prayer with you to pray every day this week. Some of you need to pray it three times a day this week. But just simply ask, God, help me to be quick to listen, to be slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I want the blessing of the righteous life you desire. But simply ask God for the benefits of this verse in His Word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would give hope and you would give healing, you would bring restoration, that you would bring forgiveness today. I thank you for those of you who, uh, uh, those of you in this room that genuinely want to grow. And I pray for you that in the name of Jesus that his word would be planted in your hearts. God, we thank you that your word never returns void but always brings a harvest. I pray, God, that in your presence you would start to work on us. God, that we wouldn't react in the flesh, but that we would respond by your spirit. God, I pray especially for those who are married. That where there has been sin, there would be repentance. Where there is bitterness, there would be healing. God, I pray for anyone who's on the edge and just feels like they can't make it. They've made too many wrong turns. God, would you comfort them today? Would you speak to them and say, I can can make a way. God, I pray that somehow in your presence, through your word and by your spirit, you would give us hope that all things are possible. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.